In this lesson, we're going to take a look at each of Houdini's network contexts and learn what they're for and when we'd use them. The object context, or what is also sometimes referred to as the scene level, is the network context that we've been working in so far throughout this course. If we were to think of Houdini as a virtual photography or film studio, then the object level is essentially the stage. It's where we set up and control our lights and cameras and it's where we arrange and compose all the different objects, props and characters which will make up our scene. Most of the parenting, rigging and animating takes place in this object context. The object context is where the bulk of our scene layout work is done. We might arrange and position a number of smaller objects together to collectively form a single larger object at the object level, but we don't really do any modelling work in the object context. All the tools we need for building, manipulating and deforming geometry are found in the geometry context. If we were to continue thinking of Houdini as a virtual film studio, then the geometry context is the workshop or the prop building department. The geometry context is a hugely important context in Houdini. Direct modelling, procedural modelling and UVing work all happens here. Understanding this context and how it relates to and works with the object context is really the place to start learning Houdini. In terms of creating 3D assets and imagery, nearly everything that you do from basic modelling to complex visual effects will involve using this geometry context. The material context is where we find all the tools we need for building materials and shaders. Most DCCs have a node-based material editor, so the material building workflow using this context should feel reasonably familiar to you if you're coming from another 3D application. The material context was introduced in Houdini 16, but in earlier versions of Houdini, materials and shaders were created in shop networks. The shop context still exists in Houdini for compatibility with older scenes, and you'll also find that when you import geometry in an exchange format such as FBX, the materials assigned to that geometry will be placed within a shop network. So whilst it's useful to be aware of the shop context, the material context is the network type that you want to be using for material and shader building going forwards. Before we go any further with talking about Houdini's different network contexts, we really should talk about the alternate naming convention for these. So far I've referred to these contexts using their more descriptive names, but you'll often hear them referred to using an entirely different name. The geometry context is still commonly called the geometry context, but you'll also hear it referred to as SOPs or the SOP context. The reason for this is that nodes within Houdini are essentially all operators, and Houdini calls geometry nodes surface operators. So surface operators become SOPs for short. You'll quickly get used to hearing other Houdini artists refer to a particular geometry node as a something or other SOP. So, for example, a bend node would be referred to as a bend SOP. A subdivide node would be a subdivide SOP. The depreciated shop context that we just talked about is called that because the nodes in that network are shader operators. And so shader operator gets shortened to shop. And this naming convention continues with the nodes in each of these other contexts. They're all referred to as a something or other op. It's also worth pointing out that the full descriptive names of these contexts also get abbreviated within Houdini. So a geometry network will often be labelled as a geo network. An object network is often referred to as an OBJ network. A compositing network also gets called an IMG or an image network. And the output context also gets called the out context. Dynamics operators are called DOPs. So when you want to work in a dynamics context in Houdini, you would add a DOP network to give you access to your dynamic operator nodes. The dynamics context is Houdini's equivalent to a film studio's effects department. The dynamics context is where we find all the tools for physics-based simulations, such as rigid body collisions, and is where we have our fluid tools for simulating effects, such as fire, smoke, and water. The dynamics context is also where all the particle tools live. In earlier versions of Houdini, particle operators, or POPs as they are otherwise known, used to live in their own dedicated POP context. But now these particle nodes all live within this dynamics context. Houdini has its own toolset for manipulating and compositing images and image sequences. And these all live within the compositing context, which is known as COPS. COPS stands for Compositing Operators. Being a node-based system, the workflow within Houdini's compositing environment is very similar to other node-based compositors such as Nuke or Fusion. The toolset is less extensive than you'd find in a dedicated compositing app like Nuke or Fusion though. 
It doesn't have tracking tools, for example, so it's not really intended as a replacement for your favorite compositor, but it's more than capable of putting together quick slap comps. Something simple which I tend to use cops for a fair bit is to edit and manipulate texture maps without having to go back out to a separate image editor. Because COPS is tightly integrated with the other contexts in Houdini, we can also use it to read in data from other contexts and process it using 2D image editing tools. An example of this would be to use COPS to convert a height field which has been created in the geometry context to a grayscale image within the compositing context and then process this using 2D image editing tools. We can then say feed that resulting edited image back into the geometry context or material context to deform or shade a surface. CHOP stands for Channel Operator, and CHOP networks give us a toolkit for operating on time-based channel data, such as animation curves or audio channels. CHOP networks are also referred to as motion effects networks. We can use them to create procedural animation, or in other words, create animation without using keyframes. For example, we can use chops to generate and precisely control a noise function to procedurally animate a camera shake or an object shaking or vibrating. Chop networks give us a collection of nodes for editing and processing audio files. So we could, for example, read in an audio track and separate out a base frequency to drive an animated parameter. We also use channel operators when creating animation constraints and when rigging objects. And it's within this chop context that Houdini's kinematic solvers live. A BOP network gives us a toolset to build VEX code in a visual node-based way. VEX is a programming language, or vector expression language is what VEX actually stands for. The VEX language is native to Houdini, and it was originally developed for shader building. In fact, the material context is essentially a VOP network. Nowadays, VOPs are not limited to material building. We can use VOPs as a low-level toolset to build our own custom operators to work on geometry and particles. And we can also use VOPs to build image editing and image generator tools. And VOPs can also be used within a CHOP network to make further motion and audio channel operators. Essentially, VOPs and the VEX language allows us to extend Houdini way beyond its already extensive toolset. Houdini has a dedicated output context for outputting renders and exporting geometry. Nodes within this output context are called ROPs, which stands for Render Output Drivers. The output context is where we would go to access render settings for Houdini's own mantra renderer or any other third party renderer. Within this context, we also have nodes for outputting OpenGL viewport renders, and the output context is also where we find nodes for exporting geometry. Because each instance of an output driver is represented by a node, we can wire them together to create render dependencies. So, for example, we could automate various sequences of render passes and render layers and rendering of different versions of an effect or an asset. When I came to Houdini from 3D Studio Max, I found Houdini's output context to be a really powerful and intuitive way of automating the output of different render layers. But Houdini 17.5 introduced the TOPS context, which provides a far more powerful and extensive toolset for automating this type of work. TOPS stands for Task Operators, and this type of network also gets referred to as PDG, which is short for Procedural Dependency Graph. Essentially, PDG is the underlying architecture, and the toolset to work within it in Houdini is TOPS. TOP networks provide us with a collection of nodes for building dependency networks to automate tasks. There's a fair degree of overlap in the kind of tools that you'll find in a TOP network and a ROP network. Both have mantra and geometry render drivers, for example and you could render the exact same sequence with the same settings from either the top or the ROP context. On one hand, we could think of the task context as being a new and improved version of the output context, but TOPS allows us to automate a much wider variety of work than we can within a ROP network. And that's because they allow us to run tasks in parallel, whereas when we wire those together in a ROP network, they get processed in a linear fashion, where one task will wait for another to finish before starting the next. So as a new Houdini user, which would you use? I would say start with just using a ROP network in the first instance. For rendering out a few single images or image sequences, ROPs is still what Houdini uses as the default context for this kind of work. Once you've become familiar with the procedural nature of Houdini and you're ready to start automating simple tasks and render sequences, then I'd say to get stuck into TOPS at that point. So that's an overview of each of the different network contexts within Houdini. 
Over the next few lessons, we're going to look at how we work with these practically in Houdini and how we share data between one network and another.